what is the most important species in an ecosystem? It seems like an odd question, but we tend to define ecosystems based on the species that are in there, and we tend to even unconsciously uh, give a certain value to each species. So what's most important? Well, in this lecture, we're going to discuss keystone and foundation species, different ways of being a very important species. So at this first, you'll need to be able to compare direct and indirect species interactions and define a keystone species, list what traits make up a keystone, define a foundation species, list which traits make up a foundation species, it's really just one trait, and define last an environmental engineer, and of course, effects of losing or introducing an environmental engineer. So let's go. So direct and indirect effects. So let's think about squirrels. Okay, squirrels and hemlock together are going to reduce the fitness of a Douglas fir plant nearby more than either alone. Why? Well, squirrels tend to eat Douglas fir pine cones underneath the shade of a hemlock tree. You'll actually find these middens. So the presence of a hemlock tree gives an area for the squirrels to actually eat. Okay, when you give an area for the squirrels to eat, they will be better off and have a better um, space to forage around there. So it increases the foraging efficiency of the squirrel in the area, thus decreasing the um, fitness of the prey. Think of it this way too. The presence of um, the presence the presence of hawks is good for oak trees. Hawks feed on squirrels, squirrels feed on acorns, therefore the presence of hawks is going to help the acorn the oak trees. So if you have something that is competing with the oak trees for space, um, perhaps alder trees, the presence of hawks could be bad for alders because the hawks eat the squirrels, the squirrels therefore don't eat the oak acorns, therefore more oak acorns can survive, and therefore more oaks are going to be in the population. So these are indirect effects. We're looking at a mediating species, the ability of a species to mediate other interactions. Take for another example the um, parasites. They have multiple hosts. So certain parasites may in, indirectly affect competition. Remember the Tribolium castaneum and Tribolium confusum example back during competition? What's happening there is there was a parasite that was more common on one than the other, and that parasite actually managed to change the reproductive rate of one of the species such that the other could attain priority effect. You can see this too with this uh, indirect and direct competition. And how the presence of a predator can actually mediate the um, competition interaction. So in the presence of mice, mice shelter under Brassica nigra, this grass, and they feed on this uh, nucella, nacella. Um, they feed on this, this grass species. So the presence of Brassica nigra has a negative competitive effect on um, Nicella, or Nacella, whatever, bunch grass. So if there was like um, lupins competing with the grasses, the presence of Brassica would be good for the lupins, but bad for the grasses. And you might have more lupins growing if Brassica is nearby and the mice are there nearby. So the brassica has an indirect effect on the competitive ability of the bunch grass mediated through the presence of mice that are sheltering underneath the brassica. And this is how you have a complex, not only food web, but a complex competition web and a complex interactions that are mediating other interactions. This is one of the essentials of community ecology is how you have indirect competitive competition, indirect amensalism. Amensalism is a zero minus interaction. And you have the, a mouse actually being able to mediate competition as well. So a lot of different effects are going on in any given community at any given time. And there are certain species that have higher impacts than others. So 
when we're talking about a species that's going to have a greater number of impacts on others, we're going to get into these special examples. These three, foundation species, environmental engineers, and keystone species, have many more interactions than other species on their, in their ecosystems. And foundation species, first off, foundation species are going to have substantial impacts because they have so much biomass. So bigger plants are going to have bigger impacts. And what's happening here in this example is your, uh, your common reed it's going to have strong impacts on the gall clusters and stem boring insects, as well as some other, well, two, two different types of gall cluster, clusters here, small ones and large ones, and stem boring insects, which are themselves going to have strong interactions on parasites, which have strong interactions, one of which has a strong interaction on uh, the blue tit. So the presence of this Phragmites australis big reed is going to impact the species nearby um, and what species are feeding on it and what species can feed on them. So the foundation species for like local prairies, if you were to think of, are going to be those bunch grasses because the bunch grasses have a large above ground and below ground biomass. So they're going to be the foundation of the prairie because there's just so much biomass on their and they're going to have impacts on community structure. So the things they compete with or the things that will eat them. So creatures that are able to, okay, kitten thing. Um, creatures that are able to eat bunch grasses are going to be very common because bunch grasses are very common. And they're going to be able to get, gain more biomass because bunch grasses have higher biomass. It's not hard to think about what's going to be like the local forest um, foundation species. Just think of what has the most biomass in the local forest. Yes, that guy again. Uh, good old Douglas fir. You think kelp forest. The foundation species for a kelp forest is kelp. Just through their biomass, they're going to have substantial impacts on the whole community structure. You just have a very large species, essentially. So these are almost always going to be plants. Huge biomass, huge impact. Environmental engineers change the environment. So by making a change in the environment, an environmental engineer is going to alter all of the um, all of the interactions, essentially. So you have this, uh, you have a leaf beetle. The leaf beetle is going to be impacted by the presence of a, of, a, of a beaver through indirect commensalism. So the beaver feeds on cottonwood trees, and the cottonwood stumps are going to produce new offshoots, and the offshoots have higher nutritional values. So you have leaf beetles that are going to be more common when Beavers are more common. It's indirectly commensalist. The, the, the beaver doesn't think about the beetle, but the beetle sure loves the presence of the beaver. Now, of course, beavers are a really good example for environmental engineers. Um, not only do their foliage change, but they make ponds. So the effects of beavers on minnows, the effects of beavers on sunfish, the effects of beavers on bats, the effects of beavers on the eagles that eat the sunfish, that eat the bass, that eat the sunfish. So all of this environment has changed because you have an environmental engineer present capable of making large scale changes and introducing many new niches. A beaver introduces a lot of new niches by damming up streams. And you have termites are going to introduce new niches by making these towers. There are now organisms that can feed on the termites. Okay, not much of a new niche. Or can live in the towers. Or can live in the towers after the termites have left or can coexist in the towers with the termites. All of these new niches made by an environmental engineer are going to increase biodiversity. Even small ecosystems, you have here Ropalomyia feeding on a goldenrod. What happens is they feed on the goldenrod's um, apical meristem, which makes the lateral meristems become more active. When the lateral meristems become more active, there are more stems that are flowering. More flowering stems, just numerically, is going to introduce more area for aphids to feed on. More aphids means more ladybugs. So Ropalomyia is going to increase. It increases the number of pollinators, too, because the, the more stems. It actually does increase plant fitness in a very odd turnabout. Uh, increases aphids, increases ladybugs, increases the wasps that feed on the aphids. So this environmental engineer changes the niches. Also, there are spiders 
that live in the um, in that little rosette formed by the Rapalamaia, by that gall. So even edaphic environments like that, edaphic meaning like little homes and shelters, it's introducing more homes and shelters for other organisms. Environmental engineers are going to increase the amount of um, niches in an environment through just changes. And then we have keystones. No, no, not that kind of keystone. No, second off. No, not that kind of keystone. The, the thing about that one, though, that keystone is holding things together. It's not a very big stone, but it's holding everything together. There we go. Keystone. Keystone species have a disproportionately large impact on everything else. So a foundational species has a proportionally large impact because it's proportionally large. An environmental engineer makes new niches. A keystone species has a disproportionately large influence on biodiversity. So they might enhance a habitat, regulate a population, function in pollination, remove genetic weaknesses, or be recycling nutrients and wastes. There are some who, or, who would argue that worms are the keystone species of planet Earth because of their functions in recycling nutrients and wastes and moving things around. Keystone predators are the first thing I want to uh, cover here because it's a great local example. A uh, keystone predator here, we have Pisaster's uh, sea star. And Pisaster's sea stars are going to feed on, well, they feed on everything. But their optimal foraging is really feeding on what is the most common organism. Now think about that. They, they feed on what's most common the best. So they may feed on mussels the best. Well, if they're feeding on what's most common, then whatever is competing and whatever is out competing everything else is going to be fed on. So they're feeding more often on whatever is most common that inherently enhances biodiversity by preventing any species from really getting a, a really large edge on this. So what will happen in the absence of Pisaster is you're actually going to end up with uh, one species out competing all of the others. And they did this a uh, good experiment where they removed Pisaster and saw the increase in um, the increase in one species until it swamped everything out else out. Reintroduced Pisaster, they Pisaster ate those species and you have an increase in biodiversity again. Um, oh yeah, a diverse subtropical food web given here, an example that you just have a greater species diversity because you have more resources available in a subtropical food web than a food web up here. But again, there's a keystone species and sometimes can be the predator. Another great example of keystone predator is going to be wolves. So wolves feed on elk. And when they feed on elk, this is good for the willow trees, which are eaten by the elk, and it's good for the cottonwood trees that are going to be eaten by the elk. And it's good for the, uh, oh yeah, it's good for the beavers because the beavers are going to be feeding on the cottonwood and willow and also making their dams up. Ah, and you introduce an environmental engineer. So you see a keystone species, wolves, indirectly makes more of an environmental engineer. The keystone species, wolves, eats the highest competitor, competitive herbivore, elk, which increases the, increases the amount of biomass present in foundation species, cottonwood and willow, which allows an environmental engineer to come in and change niches. It's complex. It's a complex little system, but you can see there keystones, environmental engineer, and foundational species. I really want you to look into that whole wolves in uh, Yellowstone National Park. It's a great example of the introduction or reintroduction of a keystone predator and seeing how it impacts biodiversity. It's a disproportionately large effect of biodiversity for the population of wolves. Look, there ended up being around 25 to 30 wolves. They changed the whole ecosystem, even though there are only, at the end, 25 to 30 of them. That's a disproportionately large impact given their biomass. So yes, they're, again, increasing diversity. So here, have we, we have here, in the absence of uh, Latoria, it's a type of um, uh, terrestrial intertidal snail, you get too much chondrus, this unpalatable algae. So, oh sorry, without manipulation, without the without changing the amount of Latoria, the non-palatable algae ends up uh, dominating. Adding Latoria is going to actually um, reduce the enteromorpha cover. So it's going to change the presence and absence of different covers. So there's even 
Um, it starts with a high intermorpha and it actually goes down and removing it from the tide pool is going to increase the palatable algae. So you change the species, interspecies interactions of algae when you introduce or remove uh, different types of snails. Removing a sea star on the other side, you remove the sea star. Um, what happens is the biodiversity is going to uh, is going to go down. They, they kind of wait. Following removal, yeah, removal it goes down, and then um, the, yeah, before removal and after removal, the biodiversity goes down. Sorry, this, I don't know why this is so complex for me to read. <laughs> Removing a keystone species is going to decrease diversity. Introducing a keystone species is going to increase diversity. There's also possibility of keystone herbivores. The question is, uh, sorry, the, the, the system isn't that different. It's a keystone herbivore. It's just getting rid of the most common competitors. So what we have is um, we have goldenrod here, and goldenrod tends to uh, overwhelm a local, a local old field ecosystem. It's a very good competitor. It uh, reproduces by ramets, so it's able to make like, every single stem is going to make five stems the following year, which really... Um, outcompete a lot of other things. They grow a lot faster than other species because they have a lot of energy they can store down uh, underground. So an old field in upstate New York will end up being dominated by goldenrod. So you'll see these fields full of goldenrod. Well, how does it move on from there? Well, seed, you know, uh, trees, tree seeds are not going to really germinate under the dense goldenrod cover. They need an opening in the canopy. Well, uh, this is Mycorapella is going to be feeding on Goldenrod. You see that, all that damage down there on the bottom of the goldenrod stem, all those wilted leaves, uh, that's Micro in action. They're going to just make the leaves wilt away, which opens up the canopy so that woody species can start growing in there. Uh, Triraptor vergata is also going to be feeding on the, um, on the green tissue at the top and thus decreasing the amount of canopy. So increasing the ability of woody plants like oak and maple to actually grow up through there. Um, and that keystone herbivore is going to prevent the ecosystem from being dominated by goldenrod. In the absence of these herbivores, and there's uh, another picture in the corner, some eggs of Ophrella conferta, another one of these species. These are all three related beetle species. And all three of them are going to decrease the competitive edge of goldenrod. And when they decrease the competitive edge of goldenrod, new woody plants can move into that area, and that can allow succession to occur. So these keystone herbivores enable succession by removing the most competitive plant species. And of course, these keystone herbivores are most common when goldenrod's the most common, because if it's over-dominating, they have more food. So that kind of enables this successional transition. And in the absence of these herbivores, you get fields dominated by goldenrod, which is why goldenrod makes such a good invader is because when it's introduced in the absence of its herbivores, it just dominates. And that's how we do this experiment for, are these really keystone species? Well, in their absence, it's an invasive weed. So looking at these keystone and foundational species again, low biomass, large effects, keystone. High biomass, high effects, foundational. And there you go. As far as environmental engineers, does it make a new niche? Last, what about mutualists? Keystone mutualists. I want you to think about the proportional impact of uh, pollinator species. What if all pollination by insects were to cease? So honeybees and bumblebees are not, um, they're not foundational species. They don't have enough biomass. Uh, they're not environmental engineers because they don't change the environment. But they may very well be keystone mutualists because they're essentially um, changing the community dynamics by, by pollinating the flowering plants, which of course allows them to reproduce, and by um, increasing the amount of fruit present, which allows uh, seed dispersal. Uh, we have other impacts on other species because these bumblebees and honeybees are increasing the fruit available to, uh, to birds and such. So that could be a case of a keystone mutualist. And I mentioned earlier worms, so perhaps keystone detritivores, because they have a higher turnover rate in the soil, they could be enabling a higher biodiversity because they're making more nutrients available. So the focus in nature specialists is generally on keystone predators, but I want to point out that keystones 
can be really anything that has a small biomass and a disproportionately large impact on biodiversity. Environmental engineers change the ecosystems. Are humans bio environmental engineers? Well, technically, yes, but they're also bad creatures because they tend to spray herbicides and pesticides and remove the very um, remove the very life that they enable by making you know, we make buildings and then we wash them from keeping to keep weeds from growing on the buildings. We open up the niche and then we shut the niche. It doesn't really count. Foundational species is anything that has a big enough biomass. So look at a, look at a an ecosystem and the thing with the most biomass, all that kelp, all those spruce trees, that's probably the foundation. That's, and those are your three different special types of species. So we're going to move into here for looking at larger and larger effects of the communities and moving on to productivity in our next lecture.